I tell you what, I say it often, but I've got a word for you today. This is an important word. Hallelujah. Grab your Bibles together and turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Luke 18. So today, we're going to look at a subject that is often misunderstood in our circles, Pentecostal faith circles. And it's so important that you listen carefully because many of you probably have not heard things uh, quite like how I'm going to present them today. The misconceptions that I want to bring out are basically two. One is taking a position that you've got to beg God in prayer. That's on one extreme. You know, part of Kelly's testimony, I like it when she shares it, but she says she grew up in a Pentecostal uh, church and she basically had got this view that if she ever wanted to get anything from God, she had to go down to the altars and cry. And if you did that and you did it right, then you're going to get your prayers answered. Well, I want you to know that begging, whining and crying, hoping and praying, trying to get God to hear you is not God's plan for us. Right. Amen. Come on. Amen. So we're going to talk about faith and what that entails in a different in a different way today, but begging God in prayer. God doesn't want us to be beggars that we're not quite sure what he will do. In one way, we're all beggars coming to God to bless us. Isn't that right? But we're talking about a different type of begging. We're talking about that you don't know what God's will is and you're trying to talk him into something and maybe if you can strike the right chord with God and get him to feel, feel something for your situation, maybe, maybe, maybe he'll, he'll respond to you. That kind of approach to God is unbiblical. Turn to your neighbor and say it's unbiblical. unbiblical. Now, so that's... That's way over in one side. And so, to be honest, we're not going to be dealing as much with that as we're going to deal with the, the ditch on this side of the road. And that is the belief that all you got to do is pray about something one time and that's it. There's a, uh, there was a West Coast pastor of a huge church in, in uh, faith circles that used to uh, that, that I used to follow. He's gone home to be with the Lord recently. But uh, I thank God for his ministry. But uh, he would often say something that uh, stuck with me at first, and I had to let go of it because I didn't believe it was biblical. I found out it wasn't so biblical. He said, if you ever prayed for anything twice, all that means is you didn't believe God the first time. And there's a number in our circles of preachers that basically kind of teach and preach along that line, is that faith is all about approaching God, believing when you pray, and then that's it, and then uh, you don't need to pray about it anymore. Well, we're going to look at, in some areas, in some ways, that does happen. I've preached before on what I call walk-away faith. And I use as the text from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, where Jesus curses the, the fig tree, and he speaks to the tree, and then he walks away from it. He doesn't just sit around waiting for something to happen, waiting to see any type of results. He spoke it, it's done, it's taken care of. As far as he's concerned, he walks away from it. There is a side of faith that is that. That you speak things and pray things, and then you walk away, so to speak, and you know now you've left it with God. But even in that particular situation, that isn't what you would call everyday a believer's everyday type of faith. We would call that a gift of special faith. A gift of special faith is that, and Jesus, God imparted those things by the Holy Spirit to Jesus as well. Jesus was the best example in the Bible of the gifts of the Spirit. And so Jesus, when you have a gift of the, of the Spirit, it like overrides anything. You don't have any scripture passages. There's no scripture promises that says you can go up to a tree, a fig tree, and say, die, die, die. <laughs> Jesus didn't have any of that. So oftentimes the gift of special faith shows up in the life of a believer by the Holy Spirit. You can't make it happen. You can try to, but it will never work. It has to be imparted to you. But it's typically something that's above and beyond the scriptures. 
When someone talks, and I've shared before, you have someone preaching on faith, and they use an example like, my car died, I laid hands on my car, and I said, in the name of Jesus, run! When I heard that as a young believer, I said, I can do that too then. And so have so many other people. Oftentimes we're careless with our, with our stories and our illustrations, and that is a gift of special faith. You have no promise in the Bible that God is going to start that car again. You do have the promise that God will take care of you. God can take care of you in a thousand and one different ways, or a million and one. He may want you to have a, a, another, another car to replace that car. Amen? And so the gift of special faith kicks in when you don't have a promise and the Holy Spirit overrides the situation, says, I'm going to do a new thing right here. And, and that's what the gift of special faith is for. Amen? In those type of situations, most of the time, it is a walk away faith. It's a, uh, the gifts of the Spirit are they come in a flash of a moment and then they're spent, so to speak, like a currency. And then when it's done, you can walk away with it and pray, praise God, and then it'll take care of the situation. I remember hearing a, a healing preacher that God had used mightily in healing said that one particular service he was in, the gifts of healing were occurring and the gift of special faith and working in miracles. Those all kind of seemed to kind of work together. And he said that the Holy Spirit showed him that there are three people in wheelchairs over, over to his left. And he said, and the Lord gave him a vision before the service that he showed him, him seeing the people, him speaking to their lives, pointing that at them in the name of Jesus. Every single one of them got up and were healed. Amen. Well, he got in the service, and of course, he just acted out. Jesus, uh, if he didn't know that, Jesus said, I, I do the things I see my Father show me. Amen. So there's many things that, we, that God can show you, and it's just simply acting out what he, that's why, that's why church is important to pray. Amen. God will show you things because you're a child of God. Amen. And so in the service, sure enough, there were these three people in wheelchairs there and he just responded, shared the vision. And they said, he pointed to them. He said, now I'm going to point at you again. And I'm going to say in the name of Jesus, the power of God's going to come on you and you're going to rise. And he pointed at them, every single one of them were raised. Didn't have to lay hands on them or anything. Now here's the point I want to make. Afterward, these people, it was a, a tremendous, mighty miracle. But afterwards, the rest of the ministry that were helping, for example, at the ministry tables, the book tables, and so forth, the, those people, some of them would come back and say, I still can't believe that happened to me. Well, obviously it wasn't their faith then. The gift, the gift of special faith can override where people's fa individual faith is at. Isn't that right? So there's a lot we don't understand and that we need to grow in understanding. Amen. How many of you are, are, are committed to praying more that God will give you greater understanding to the gifts of the Spirit? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But see, we need to understand that going and talking about the car situation, if there's no word for it, if something happens, then that is a, either a gift of special faith or working of miracles that happen in that situation. In other words, you can't hear that and go repeat it and expect results. I think I need to say that again. In other words, you can't hear a testimony like that, even if it was shared in a, in a, a careless way. If you can't go and try to repeat it and have results in that area. Because it's not faith true every day, Bible faith, that we are called to walk by faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The gift of special faith comes by the Holy Spirit in a moment of time. Do you see that? And so oftentimes we have had, we have had failures in our spiritual walk. You know, you hear things, wow, that's exciting, I'm going to walk on that, I didn't know that, that was in the gospel, or we can do that, and, and you act on and nothing happens, and you get disillusioned. And then you wonder if this thing, this, all this stuff is true or not. Right, come on. You see? And so it's very important, you know, now the, there's a pastor's anointed on me, and that, that includes as well as other anointings, but the pastor's anointing means that 
cares for the sheep, walks with the sheep, someone who's traveling through, you'll get results, you know, kind of skim off the top type of thing, but it's the pastors typically that have to deal with people on a a day-to-day, week-to-week basis and help them, the majority of people that don't receive in those special meetings, how to help walk them into receiving from God. Amen? Are you with me today? So it's important then that we understand there are two extremes here. We do not want to be in this ditch over here that thinks, oh, we got to pray, keep praying, repeating our prayer over and over and over until God does something, hoping and praying. Or over here that we pray one time and then kind of wash our hands. And what I would call, that's lazy faith. And it, isn't it amazing that that, that, type of, that type of thinking is pervasive in our culture? Because we are so used to being lazy. Didn't I say we? So we like everything fast. You know, we, we, we like to be able to, we have the microwaves, we have, you know, we like to just pull up, gas up the car. We, we like to be able to, everything's quick, come on. And so we think prayer is the same way. And so we adapt and adopt a thinking that we can just pray about one thing and then just let the whole thing just kind of escape my mind and not even think about it ever again. I'm telling you that this right here is possibly the greatest reason why we have prayer failures as charismatic, spirit-filled believers is because we don't understand the subject of being persistent in prayer. Amen. Now, I've been around faith circles for a long time. I want you to know, there's no two faith preachers that preach the same. Okay? I heard one preacher one time preach, you know, that I, there, there's no one I, I agree with totally, and he said, I don't even agree with myself totally. <laughs> but you have people that kind of put us all in the same camp, and it's like, okay, uh, you know, it's important to understand there's not any strict doctrine, but here's an example of somebody that misunderstands. I got a, we got an email at the church this week. This happens every now and then. Sometimes it was when Kelly was on staff as pastor, we'd say, you need to uh, get rid of that woman pastor. Shouldn't have women pastors. Well, you know what type of background they're coming from. Only men should be in charge. Amen. How many of you know that's not our type of church? Amen. This one says, here's, they send us a prayer request. Please repent and renounce all word of faith beliefs, doctrines, and practices. Do not, false, do not follow false teachers like Copeland, Hagen, Duplantis, Dollar, Meyer, Beth Moore. Beth Moore is not faith. Anyway, and others to the everlasting lake of fire where Paul and John, Jan Crouch currently reside. Now, that ain't right. That ain't cool. You know, when we first would get these years ago, I'd kind of, I'd respond every now and then. I never respond to those things anymore. So, you know, it's important. I will say this. In our misconception series, we have been dealing with things that have been even misunderstood in our circles. Okay? So we want to put the Bible first. And don't believe anything because I say it. Believe it because the Bible says it. And don't believe it because maybe your favorite preacher says something. Come on. Amen. So let, let's go ahead and jump into this subject. So this idea then of the need for persistent prayer. That's going to be the title for today's message. The need for persistent prayer. And I will have to say this from the beginning. Because I've been around since, since the early 80s, 1980s, in charismatic and word and faith circles and so forth, I'm telling you, and I am a devourer of, it dates me here, of cassette teachings and, and books, and it's like, do people even buy books that much anymore? It's like now they just go online, everything has changed so much. But uh, there, is an, there is an overwhelming... And I can't exaggerate that enough. There's an overwhelming lack of teaching in our type of churches on the subject of persistent prayer. So I'm praying that you guys would just be open-minded about this. Amen? And I just thank God because our church is more biblically literate than than most. And so you're going to be able to understand some things today. Uh, I've been uh, working on a book entitled Earnest Prayer. 
And this actually is the fifth, the fifth type in defining what earnest prayer is. Who knows, maybe I'll come back next, next Sunday and preach on the first four. Looking at the life of Elijah and how he went to the top of, of Mount Carmel and prayed and God did some amazing things. So we're going to start here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Are you there? So, and this is, many of these verses are up on, your, on our screens up here, but uh, you can go ahead and read along in your own versions as well. So we find that Jesus, in Luke's Gospel, 18, said this. He said, He spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, and he gives a parable, there was, a certain, and there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God, nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me. Man, she wanted some answers. Get justice for me and from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her, by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord, Jesus, said this. Here he's going to give an give a, a understanding now to the story that he just shared. He said, now hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now I'm going to share some things. You'll have to buy my book when I finally get it out <laughs> to get more on this subject. But I want to share the things that the Holy Spirit wants me to share today. In this passage, a couple of things we want to stand out in, in, and, and point out and then go on to some other passages. First of all, if you notice on the bottom of this last verse here, in verse 8, he says, When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? In the beginning, it says that men, he's going to speak a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. I believe it's the NIV version that says, and not give up, not quit. Okay, He's talking about persistent praying. That men always ought to pray. And let me tell you something now. I try not to point out things that, that are unnecessary in, in messages, but it's necessary today. It's necessary to understand that the, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And in Greek, if someone doesn't know Greek, they won't understand this. And that's why preachers should, should study these things so that they can pull them out and show them. But it's important to understand that the tense of the word that Jesus said, that men always ought to pray, is in a continuous sense in the Greek. In other words, the proper translation is men always ought to pray and keep on praying and not give up. And not stifle it. That's also in a continuous sense. In other words, and not continually quit and get discouraged. So we need to understand, we can be discouraged because we're not seeing something. But Jesus said, I'm going to talk to you now about how you need to keep praying and not give up on it. A continual sense of that. Are you with me here? Now, if you look in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. We do not have this up on the screen. I'm going to leave this one up here because I'm going to come back to it in just a second. But in your own Bibles, in Matthew chapter 7, here is an example. Some of the versions today translate this properly. Many do not. But just because it's translated properly in this passage, it does not mean they do it consistently in other passages. What are you talking about? I'm talking about how it's important to understand when it comes to, Pastor, when I pray, you know, I've heard preachers pr preach like when I pray about something, I'm supposed to just pray and then that's it. Is that not true? Well, basically, no. Stay with me today now. 
In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, it says, Jesus said, in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Amplified version, for example, translates this. New Living Translation translates this properly. It's really what it's saying. It's in a tes- tr- present tense in the Greek. There's a reason why those verbs are in certain types of tenses. Because, praise God, unlike English, which is a little bit cumbersome and not as accurate, the Greek language with the New Testament was written in has a wonderful, vast amount of conveying, ways of conveying proper truth to its readers. Amen. In this verse, the proper way to translate this is ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Now he's talking about prayer here. He's talking about how oftentimes we can be on the ditch on this side over here when we think, well, I'm going to ask, and I'm going to be a good sport about it. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask this one time, maybe twice. And I'm just gonna, then I'm gonna forget about it and just, well, whatever. I'm gonna tell people God's taking care of it, whatever. Wait a second. And then people can go on and go on for weeks and months and even years and see no results. Major reason is because they don't understand that Jesus talks about the importance of being persistent in prayer. Ask, not just one time. Seek, not just, you know, hey, did you find your car keys yet? Yeah, I saw it. I, I looked around for them, I couldn't find them. Guess we better go get another car then. <laughs> we say something's wrong with that person. Right? But why don't we say that when someone's acting like that in prayer? Knock. Well, I knocked, but no, you know, no one answered, so I left. Jesus talks about someone that knocked in the middle of the night. He knocked and he needed help from a neighbor, a friend, and he kept on knocking till the lights came on. How long do I knock, Pastor, until the lights come on? How long do I knock, Pastor, until the front door gets opened? Amen? We often talk about the importance of the the acronym P-U-S-H, push. We need a push in the Spirit. Well, how long do I pray? Pray until something happens. All right? We're going to see now how this connects, though, with the the quote-unquote word of faith message, because it does, but we need to do it accurately. Amen? Hallelujah. You still with me today? Yes. So we see then, here is the same type of tense that Jesus uses in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. We're going to see also, hold on to your hat, that Jesus also uses it in Mark 11, 24. Okay, so what well, we need to understand then that there are some things that, that are about faith, it says in the very end of that, in Luke's Gospel chapter 18, he says that persistent prayer is also a faith prayer. Do you get that? He's saying, I'm going to talk to you about being persistent in prayer, and then he's saying, I wonder if people will be in faith when I come back. What's another way of saying this? He's saying, I'm wondering if people will be persistent in prayer, in faith, when I come back. Or are they going to have this kind of uh, uh, weird Frankenstein idea of faith, where they're in a ditch over here. I just prayed about that, and I'm, I'm just praying about everything just once. And I'm just saying, whoa, praise God, that's done, it's done. I wash my hands of the whole thing. And then you walk away, and then we wonder why our friends and, and, and family members don't come to Christ because they see how weird we are. Well, uh, I, I prayed about healing, I'm healed. <laughs> I'm healed. You're healed? You don't sound healed. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Wait a second. We need to understand more carefully, and you, we, we, we could reach more people for Jesus Christ if we do it God's way. And we'll get more results if we do it God's way. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Now, you still with me? I might have to ask you several times throughout the, throughout the course here. Turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. So we do have this up on the screen. And I want you, I want you to see this. Here is another passage that we need to understand. 
And I want you to zero in on one particular word as we kind of read through this. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. This is Matthew's account of the fig tree situation. Verse 20 says, When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? Then Jesus answered. That's what we see up on our screens. Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was, what was done to this fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. I want you to know it's verse 22. So we're going to zero in on And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Believing you will receive. Now listen, the key word there I want you to see is believing. Do you see that? Some of the versions don't translate it accurately in a literal version. Some of the versions might say, you know, uh, if you ask in faith, whatever you ask, will, you will receive. But the key is, that's why I, I like, and it's a very important that you study the Bible out of a literal version. Literal version, in, in other words, they're, they're not you know, giving a general gist of what they think the verse is saying. They're word-by-word -word translation type thing. And when you, you study that, then you see it might, it will be oftentimes more awkward, but oftentimes the awkwardness alerts you to there's something here that I need to dig into further to get a greater understanding. Okay, amen. And so what we see here is we see this talking about believing when you pray, believing. That's in a present tense again. That's in whatever things you ask in prayer, you need to continually believe. Yes. Not believe one time when you pray over here and then everything's taken care of. You need to continue believing. Now, having said that, hold on to that, and let's go ahead and now look at the passage about Elijah. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18. Now, are you still with me? Yes. Now, while you're turning there, fix your eyes on the screens up here and look at James chapter 5. It says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, that's anthropos in the Greek, by the way, which means male or female, not just a male person, of a righteous person avails much. Now, why are we taking time uh, to spend on this subject today? Because we want our prayers to avail much. We don't want to crash and burn with our prayers. And then it says, in James, James was known as the apostle of prayer. History has it. It says he prayed so much that the, it, the tradition has it that he had knees like camels. That he was on his knees so much that it affected how his knees looked. And so it, it, it kind of spread out his knees and so he had knees like camels. He was a man of prayer. And he's trying to get this across now. He says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. In other words, he was just like us. And he prayed. But he prayed a certain way. Sure. Anybody can pray. Even an unbeliever can pray. But he prayed earnestly. Everybody say earnestly. earnestly. That it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Praise God. Yeah. Earnest prayer. Persistent prayer. In 1 Kings chapter 18 now, and we do have these up here on the screen as well, we find that this is the account, this is the Mount, Mount Carmel account. Elijah thought he was the only prophet that was faithful to the Lord Jehovah. The prophets in the, in the nation of Israel, they're a backslidden nation. They had prophets to Baal, false gods, false prophets. And many of them had turned away from the Lord. And so he comes on the scene, the Lord showed him, show up on Mount Carmel, Tell the king, King Ahab, wicked, wicked king, come, bring all these prophets of Baal, let's do something. Let's make it for sure, once and for all. You have all the prophets of Baal build an altar over there, put a sacrifice on it, cry out to Baal, and I'll do the same thing over here, 
for Jehovah. And the one who answers with fire, he's, he's the real God. Ahab said, great. Prophets of Baal said, yes. They went ahead, built the altar. They're going through all their motions, crying and wailing. And as their custom, the Bible says it was their custom. Nothing was happening. They were doing it all day. Elijah just over here kind of looking at this nonsense. And they began to cut themselves. And their own blood now is gushed, gushed, uh, pouring forth onto the altar and the sacrifice itself. All day. Elijah even taunted them a little bit. Nothing happened. And then Elijah said to all the people, come here. They came over to this side, came over to the altar. He repaired the altar, got the sacrifice, poured water on the sacrifice. In the midst of a famine. You don't light things with water. You're supposed to pour gasoline on it, right? He said, do it again. Poured water. Built a trench around it. Do it again. Soaking wet. Water all the way around the thing. He prays a short, simple prayer and said, Lord, I'm doing this because you told me to. He had already got a word from the Lord. Yeah. Let them know that you are God. Yeah. Fire came down from heaven struck the altar, lit it on fire, all the people fell on their faces and said, Jehovah, he is God. Man, they had revival that day. Prophets of Baal were put to death. I mean, it was a mini revival. It didn't last, unfortunately. How many of you know you can have revival and doesn't mean it's going to sweep through a nation? There needs to be follow through. But they had revival that day. And Elijah then turned to Ahab, who was there. And he said, I want you to go ahead and go eat. Go have a little feast. Because rain is coming. I hear the sound of rain. He got something already from the Lord that the Lord was finally going to end this three and a half year long drought. He got the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. And he told him, I'm already even hearing it. I'm already even grasping it inside my heart that it's coming. That's what we find now, this passage. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. And so Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. That's a literal version. Some of your other paraphrased versions say he prayed. Well, that's really what's happening. It's a, it is the, uh, a position of prayer. Matter of fact, it's a position of giving birth. Maybe I'll talk about more of that next week. And so he's praying, and then Elijah, in verse 43, says this. He says to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And Elijah said, well, that's okay, it's still going to come, let's go. No, he had a job to do. He was giving birth to something. He was cooperating with God. He said, now go up, go up, go up again. Verse 44, then I came to pass, it came to pass the seventh time. He went seven times that finally the servant said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand. How long did he pray? How long did he push? Pray until something happens. Now get this church, this is so very important. It is not enough to just get a word from the Lord. To see that come to pass in your life. It's not enough to even get a revelation of the promise of God to see that fulfilled in your life. It is not enough. God, now sometimes it is. Sometimes, it's, but not normally. There needs to be a giving birth. There needs, God wants us to cooperate where he's going to bring about a miracle, but we need to, as the Bible says, lay a hold of the promise of God. Amen. Amen. Not just kind of touch it a little bit with your little pinky. All right. Oh, that's wonderful. Isn't that exciting? And then I walk away and I prayed, had the pastor lay hands on me, everything's fine. We need to know what it means to wrestle in the presence of the Lord. Amen. You out there? Yep. And so Elijah, he said, I'm not done. After the first time, there's still no, no response. Well, I'm not going to stop praying. All right. What would have happened if he would have stopped praying? What would have happened with Daniel if he was fasting and praying? It says he got to fasting and praying and he gave up. Bible says he prayed for 21 days, three weeks straight, fasting and praying. 
What would have happened if he gave up after one day? Five days, 10 days, even 20 days. When, what happened at the end of 21 days, the angel of the Lord came and said, Daniel, you have been heard. And I was sent the first day. But there's things going on, Daniel, you, didn't, you don't know about in the spiritual realm. I wonder if Daniel would have stopped and gave up if the angel just would have turned around and went back to heaven. I wonder if Elijah, if he would have stopped praying after the second, the third, the sixth time. I wonder if then the nation of Israel would have been totally destroyed because of a drought that continued for another six months, another year or more. I wonder in our own lives how many miracles bypass us because we give up. I wonder how many times Jesus is passing us by and we are not like blind Bartimaeus in the, the, the senses that he does have. He knows something's happening and the crowd is passing him by and he shouts and he keeps on shouting. I wonder if he would have given up. What would have happened to him? I wonder what would have happened. The Gospels talk about a woman, a Syrophoenician woman that came, said, my daughter needs healing. And Jesus didn't even pay attention to her. And then the disciples come, came back to Jesus and say, Jesus, she's still pestering us. She's still crying after us, New King James says. She is not giving up. And then she comes and she falls down before Jesus and the Bible says he worships him. And, she, and Jesus said it's not right to give the children's bread to dogs. Jesus just, in a sense, man, how politically incorrect that is. Called the woman basically a dog. Stereotypes of, Jew, of Jews, we're better than you type of thing. Jesus was not, was not being a, a racist. Jesus was not being insensitive. He was wanting to find out how persistent was she going to be. She could have got real mad at, yeah, you see people get mad at preachers and get mad at God and so forth. It hasn't happened. Uh, Mama just got worse. Daddy died. You know, my prayers don't, I'm not going, I'm not following all that stuff anymore. And a lot of it is our fault, not their fault. Because we're the ones that tell them that they just have to pray one time and that's it. And God's a good God, and he's, he's, he's like a, a vending machine. Just put the coin in, push the button, and it's going to come out. So I have a lot of, of uh, patience and, and, and love for someone like that because I, I think I've been a part of that as well. Come on. So I wonder how many miracles pass us by because we don't hear teaching and preaching on being persistent in prayer. Jesus said that you got to be persistent and not give up. And am I going to see that type of character in, in prayer when I come back? You see that? Now, look at what Jesus said. If you go back to Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, he said, And shall not God respond and hear when his own elect pray one time? No, pray day and night. Day and night. Come on, there's a part of us that we, we need to just push in and push in and push in. Amen. I'm going to try to tie, tie this all together so you understand it's not saying something different from faith. I'm, it's just, it's, it's the faith message has left this part out and is not taking into account that this is actually a major, the more, the bigger part of what prayer should be like. And so what we see then is Elijah did not give up until after the seventh time, the servant came back and I see something going on. It's a cloud out there. It's like it's the size of a hand out there. And Elijah said, okay, we got it. And then he went and sent to Ahab and said, you get up and you go because the rain's coming and you better get up and ride away or you're going to be caught. And so he took off. And that was the miracle right after that, that Elijah, he, Bible says, he kind of tied up his, his cloak, so forth, and he ran under the power of the Holy Spirit and outrun Ahab's chariots. Right. Woo! I, I think Elijah knew something about the miraculous. And so we see this, and so James says this, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, and, and it was 
Elijah, just like us, but he tied into something. He tied in when you pray, you don't let go until you get the answer. Now are you still with me? Hallelujah. How much more time do I have to share with all this? Oh, this is important. Now turn over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. I think I have enough time to just deal with this passage now. How many of you know Mark's in the New Testament? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So much more I could share today. Just checking the Holy Spirit what He wants. So in verse 22, we see up on our screens, Jesus answered and said to them, because they're wanting to know how in the world could He get results like He did. He said, have faith in God. Now, I know sometimes, you know, people say, well, have the God kind of faith type of thing. And that is kind of true there. But they miss it when they say things, and I've, I've taught like that. But really, the point is, have, make sure your faith is pointing in the right direction. Your faith needs to be in God. Amen. Not in yourself. Amen. Not in the banker. Not in your boss. Not in your spouse. Right. Come on, not in your parents. Not even in your pastor. Your faith has to be in God. Jesus is saying, listen, the reason why I get results is because I, I certainly don't have faith in you guys. <laughs> he already knew some things are going to, they're, they're going to scatter. There's going to appear to scatter. My faith is in God. Hallelujah. And then he said this in verse 23, for surely I say to you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Okay. I don't have time to get further in verse 23. Let's look at verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray. Once again, I share with this several weeks back. Jesus is using a, a euphemism. He's exaggerating. Obviously, he's not saying anything that comes into your mind. He's not meaning that. He's saying you need to see, though, that God is a God. He's, he's the only one that can do the impossible. Amen? Don't, don't ask don't ask for my wife. She's my wife. Right. I was thinking several weeks back after that one message I preached, I said, you know, uh, you know, I would love to fly without an airplane or anything. I'm going to ask God if I could fly like a bird. <laughs> Defy gravity. You all be coming to my funeral real soon here. <laughs> local pastor, local faith pastor stepped off the building downtown Milwaukee saying he's going to fly because he prayed, according to Mark eleven twenty four. 24. I desire that. Come on, how many of you can say you have some desires? It doesn't mean just any desire you can come up with. So we already dealt with that. It needs to be according to God's word, amen, his will. And so whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, I've got to share something here. The Greek text that had been accepted for years, called the received text, had been accepted for centuries, where you had translations of the, of the King James Version, New King James Version. This passage has a little bit different reading in the Greek than these current translations do. In a key word, and the only reason I bring this out is because you need to know this. How many of you know in some of the newer translations, you might get to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, and they'll cut the whole chap, the whole second half. These signs shall follow them to believe. No, that's not in the original manuscripts. Can't believe that anymore. Some might even just put it in the footnotes. We said, no, 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 no. They, they're going by uh, a different gr Greek manuscript. And in that Greek manuscript, didn't have the rest of these signs shall follow them that believe. In other key passages in there. You're not going to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's not in there, okay? So I'm not going to get into the difference of these, these, these Greek uh, uh, translations here, but it's important to understand this. In this particular verse, when he says, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe. 
is in the present continuous sense. It doesn't mean believe one time. It means believe and keep on believing. Just like it means ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Not only that, church, when it says, and you receive them, that is also in the Greek in the present tense. Why is that so important? Because that also says, Believe, keep on believing that you receive and that you're, you are continually receiving the thing. This newer Greek version has what's called an aorist tense for receive, which can be translated, doesn't have to be all the time, can be translated that you have received in the past. That's why you have some of these newer versions actually say it. Believe that you have received. That's typically in the faith message, how it has been preached. I believe it's inaccurate. Why is that so important? Because it does not give way to the proper understanding of being persistent in prayer. Jesus is saying, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe, not just one time, and not just receive one time, now it's taken care of. Now I know some preachers might say, hey, you know, uh, and I do sometimes. Has anything changed? Some pre some, many, many preachers will say, well, just go believe that it's already taken care of. Do you know when that happened with Jesus? Jesus laid hands on a guy in the Gospels that was blind. He even spit on the guy's eyes. That's like a double anointing spit on his eyes, and then laid hands on his eyes. And then Jesus asked, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees walking. In other words, everything's so blurry, but he's seeing something. Jesus, the Gospels, do not say that he said, just go your way, confess that you're already healed. Jesus laid hands on him again. Getting back to what I said earlier at the very beginning about one, one famous faith preacher saying, if you've ever prayed twice about something, you, you, the first time you prayed was not in faith, which isn't true because you could have prayed in faith and you could have got out of faith. There is an area that you can get out of faith. In other words, you can get back into unbelief. Are you out there? But to think that faith then... Also, the faith is some, some, it's a one-time thing, and you've got to confess that it's all taken care of now. All I've got to say, I believe I've got it. I believe it's done. Now, I only have a few minutes left, so I want you to listen very closely to me. What is Jesus saying here, though? Jesus laid hands on the guy a second time and said, now what he's, he's, everything's, everything's well. Same type of people who say, don't pray a second time ever about something. We'll say never get, your, get hands laid on you a second time for the same issue. Jesus laid hands on a guy twice. I think it was good enough for Jesus. Amen? Are you out there? So don't ever say that to somebody ever again. That's wrong. That's unbiblical. Some people need to get the hands laid on them again. The point is, so what is Jesus saying? When you pray, something should happen. The prayer of faith is when you pray, you connect with God. Are you out there? I, I wrote down some of these things this way. You have to get my book to get it all. <laughs> the prayer of faith, listen carefully, knows some things. When you know, how do I know if I'm really praying the prayer of faith? The prayer of faith will raise up the sick. The prayer of faith knows some things. It knows that God heard the first time. It knows that God's promises are yes and amen. It knows that God is willing to do something about the thing. And knows that God stamped the request yes or received. So Daniel, the angel, it was decreed from the throne of God. I got an answer for Daniel. Hey, Gabriel, go take that answer. It was heard from heaven. Daniel didn't give up until the answer came. Do you see that? 
And so Jesus is saying, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, you need to connect. Stop begging. Stop wondering. In other words, some of you need to pray again because you never prayed in faith to begin with. You know, too often times we pray too quickly. Now, I mean this. We should always be quick to pray. Pray, Lord, what is your, what is your will? Show me in your word. What should I, what do I, should I trust you in in this area? What's your will in this area? Always be quick to pray that. But I'm saying trying to be quick to pray, Lord, do something about this area. When you don't even know what God's will is, you don't even know what God's promises are, your heart is not full of faith, you're full of doubt. And it says in James chapter 1 that when you're like that, let not that man think that he'll receive anything from God. I mean, that hits me because I want to be a real Christian. I want to see real results in my life and my relationship with God. Amen. Now, are you still with me? So Jesus said, what sort of things you desire when you pray, make sure your, your heart is an expectant heart right then. Something's going to happen. But when you go in that sense, you know, praise God, Jesus is, is the healer. Hallelujah. You know something's going to happen here. Praise God. You know there's going to be a breakthrough. You've got, you got, you got to be spiritually pumped with faith. Hallelujah. Expectancy. Instead of coming down for prayer, I don't know. Pastor, pray for me. There's no expect. Come down like you're actually going to receive something. If I was giving out a free cart today, First one comes down, I got at the car keys right here. I guarantee you, the people at the front of the line are going to be people like, oh. you'll see a lot of carnal, <coughs> Black Friday type stuff, you know. <laughs> but so, so some expectancy, what sort of things you desire? When you pray, be expectant. Know that you know that God's going to hear. Because when, you know, when you know that God has heard you, then you know you have the petitions that you've asked of him. Now, what does that mean? You know you have the petition. It means that you know he stamped the request. It's been approved. Now it's passed on down the chain. And you don't have it yet. If you want to say you have it, that's fine. That's okay, but you don't have to. What we try to encourage, we've encouraged Kelly, haven't we, for years, is say this. Just go saying this. I believe someone getting hands laid on them for healing, physical healing. Just go believing that God's insane, God's healing is working in me now to bring... We taught our girls to say that. They know this. You'd ask them. They know this. To, I believe God's healing power is working in me. It's working right now. Not it's over. I'm healed. God's healing power is working. Whatever the thing. God's working that financial situ situation out. I believe that. What sort of things you die? When you pray, believe and keep on believing. Don't give up and keep on believing that you are receiving. You are in that process of receiving that thing. Hallelujah. It's coming. Glory to God. The pipeline, God has already turned the pipeline right toward you. you. Just look up there with the eyes of faith. I hear the abundance of rain. Glory to God. But I'm not giving up. I'm going to stand in there. What do I do? Do I keep repeating the same prayer? Over? No. You go to God, though, and the Bible says, come now, let's reason together. We remind. He says, come, remind me of my word. Hallelujah. We remind. Lord, I'm trusting you in this area. I want you to know that I'm trusting you, that you're bringing this about. I'm trusting you for this miracle that, that, that it's happening happening that you've said yes and I'm trusting you and it's okay it's not you don't start the prayer all over again and say now I'm going to believe you right now from this point on you say I'm, I'm believing I've been believing since I prayed but I'm believing but I you tell the Lord I'm not letting go until I see it and really we get to be like the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6 where they cry out from under the throne of God in the altar of God and they say how long O Lord there's nothing wrong with his children saying, Lord, how long? You promised I'm believing you. Now, how long? How long until that cloud comes, until the rain clouds come? I'm staying in here. I'm giving birth to that thing. I'm expecting. And so Jesus says, I'm giving you this parable so you would not give up. So you would not quit in prayer. Amen? So that you stand. And having done all to stand, to stand in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Praise God. That's her name.